Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Poland Daily History. On June 28th this year, Poland celebrated the 100th anniversary of the signing of the Versailles Treaty. The Versailles Treaty forced Germany to allow a Polish state to be reborn, as well as respecting its western border. An accomplishment largely owed to the famous pianist Ignacy Paderewski. Today, we will be speaking to the historian Dr. Shishap Yabonka about the background, the implementation, and the importance of the Versailles Treaty. For the Versailles Treaty to be upheld, the war has to be won. And I was wondering, what are the Polish side's effort during the war? Who did they fought for? What are the scale of their troops? The Poles did fight on both sides. Although the Poles clearly had to settle some things with Tsarist Russia from the times of the January uprising in the 19th century, and in general, all uprisings which were aimed at the Russian state. This is why most Poles sided with Austria. There, the so called First Cadre Company was established with around 180 young people, which grew to around 20,000 Poles. Polish legions on the Austro-Hungarian side. It was even expected that the Austrian state would turn into a three-part Austro-Hungarian-Polish monarchy. Hence, three brigades were formed. One fought at the front on the Vistula River on Polish territory, and the other went to the Carpathian Mountains to defend the Hungarians. Eventually, all three brigades, in the strength of 25,000 young people, were gathered in the area of Volinia, today's western Ukraine, and then the edge of the Tsarist state. The three Polish brigades were located at the meeting point of the German army and the Austrian army. During the powerful attack of the Russian state, the so-called Brusilov Offensive, Poles withstood a four-day attack of armies five to seven times stronger. They withdrew between the 1st and 4th of July 1916. This attracted attention to both monarchs, German and Austrian, which announced the resurrection of the Kingdom of Poland, a tiny yet autonomous territory. This land had the right to have a Polish armed force, which was quite scornfully called the Polish Wehrmacht. In the meantime, the Tsarist Empire collapsed, and the Poles shifted their sympathies to the Entente. On the Western Front, the Poles fought against Germany from the very beginning, and they were the only enemy whom everybody agreed to fight against. There were no Polish forces on Germany's side, yet they were on both the Austrian and Russian side. In the moment when the Poles turned their sympathy to Russia, there were as many as three Polish calls created from Poles once incorporated into the Russian armed forces. The first call in Belarus under General Dovbor Musnitsky, the second in Moldova under General Stankiewicz, and the third in Ukraine. In total, they had almost 100,000 units. Unfortunately, Russia lost the war, these areas were occupied by Germany, and they disarmed these corps. They did it in such a way that they released the officers and soldiers which returned to Poland and took part in defeating the Germans. On top of that, the French government, after declaring the Republican government and Republican Russia, granted Poland the right to independence and agreed to the formation of a Polish army and France. At its peak, it had almost 100,000 thousand soldiers, 98,000 with supplies, tanks, airplanes and a huge number of weapons and equipment. This army managed to take part in the peak moment of the end of the First World War. It outweighed the scales and was a very important argument that if the Germans did not reach a truce, this army would enter Germany and the Germans were terrified of this, of the Polish entering Germany. In the end, around Easter 1919, so just before signing the Treaty of Versailles, it was sent to Poland in eight great echelons and fueled the newly formed Polish army. This allowed to finish the war with Western Ukraine concerning the city of Lviv and Galicia, but it was an extremely valuable acquisition to defeat the much more dangerous Bolshevik army in the next year. The Poles ultimately won this war, they won their independence and and still exist as a state. Polacy ostatecznie tę wojnę wygrali, niepodległość ocalili i jako państwo istnieją nadal. The Polish troops, which fought in the First World War, gained important experience as soldiers, 
which made it possible for them to defeat the Soviet Bolsheviks in the 1920 Polish-Bolshevik War. Next up, we will ask Dr. Jabłonka about the treaty signed between the two sides after the war. The Poles defeated the Bolsheviks in 1920, and how did the treaty they signed look like? Bardzo ciekawie się zakończyła wojna z bolszewikami. Otóż rozejm zawarto jeszcze... The war with Bolsheviks was very interesting. The truce was reached at the end of the year 1920, on October 18th. It was very important for the Poles that their prisoners return to Poland before winter. The prisoners taken by the Soviet army and imprisoned in Siberia. There was their 12,000 unit strong Polish division, which failed to escape because of the negative attitude of the Czech Corps. Only 3,000 people were released and seven, eight to 9,000 Poles were taken prisoner. They wanted to save these prisoners before the frosts, which were to come in the winter. Unfortunately, the Russians decided to first settle the treaty and then release the Polish prisoners. The negotiations were very lengthy and took place in Riga, in a neutral location, the capital of Latvia. The Latvians facilitated the negotiations, during which the Bolsheviks agreed to pay the Poles 13 million rubles in gold. They also had to sign a commitment to return all cultural goods from which they plundered Poland in the last 150 years. In this Treaty of Riga, signed on the 18th of March 1921, there was everything. The limitation of the border, mutual recognition of states with the exception of sanctions, and what would have happened if Russia simply decided to not pay the Poles anything. They were also given a choice between regaining their valuable treasures of gold. The Poles chose cultural goods. The treasures returned, tapestries adorned the Valvo castle, the Sterbiets, or the notched sword, the coronation sword of kings, hangs at the very entrance. The castle was also decorated with many valuable Polish trophies. Unfortunately, the Poles never received any compensation for 100 years of slavery. So I heard some say that the Poles could have gained more territory from the treaty than they have gotten, and do you think this theory is founded? This is true. The Bolsheviks never paid too much attention to territory. They thought Russia was large enough. The only thing that they demanded was recognition of a separate Ukrainian state. This was all the more humbling for Poland, as they were the only European country which recognized the independent state of Ukraine, truly independent, not Soviet. Now we had to betray our Ukrainian ally by recognizing the Soviet state, which was completely alien to the Ukrainians. In this moment, the Polish army moved 200 kilometers farther away from the border, and the Bolsheviks agreed to give Poland a territory which was several thousand kilometers larger. However, there was a trap here. The idea was that the newly formed state would consist of only minorities, and these minorities together would outweigh the number of Poles. Then the Polish nationalists decided that in the future state, the number of Polish residents must be at least 60% and cut off areas in which the number of Poles was much larger. It was then named Dzerzhinszczyzna from the leading communist Dzerzhinsky or Machlevszczyzna in Ukraine. This population was left to be devoured by the Bolsheviks or unfortunately murdered, as in Belarus in the Kurapaty, the outskirts of Minsk. They would also be deported to Kazakhstan in 1936, where to this day they are the largest minority in the state. As we have seen today, the Versailles Treaty was crucial for Poland to reappear on the map after 123 years of partition by Russia, Prussia and Austria. The Polish delegation to Paris had to work hard to convince the great powers to draft a treaty that's favorable to Poland. It was made possible by the excellent cooperation between the three fathers of Polish independence, Piłsudski, Domowski, Paderewski, showing just how much could be done by working together. I'm your host, Benjamin Lee, and I'll see you next time on Poland Daily History.